Pleasure to meet everyone. My name is Jonathan Uriarte Lopez, but feel free to call me John is what I go by. I'm an undergraduate researcher at the Developmental Cognition and Neuroimaging Lab, also known as the Deacon Lab, over here at Oregon Health and Sciences University, uh, just out of, up, the, up the hill here in Portland. I'm an undergraduate researcher up there, and my, my project is going to be about uh, improving the quality of neuroimaging scans. So without further ado, let us begin. So here's a, a little bit of an overview of my project. Uh, the main, our main project is to study the brain, specifically subjects who have been diagnosed with autism. Now the problem with uh, autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder, so we need, to, we need to study the brain, but we're humans, we're not cars, we can't just like pop the hood, see what's going on with the engine, and pop it back up. So that's why we use this, te this technique called MRI imaging, which stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging, and this is done so we can, are able to take images of the brain safely in, in, uh, in subjects. So ASD, also known as autism spectrum disorder, is, like, as I mentioned, is a neuro neurodevelopmental disorder. It's something that the, that the, the patient has and is stuck with them for the rest of their lives. And it's com commonly characterized by these following symptoms. They have a hypersensitivity to stimuli, whether it be light, sound, a lot of people around. They're just able to feel them a little bit, a little bit more. As, and they also have a restricted and repetitive, repetitive behavior, so they tend to follow the same routine over and over again. And, some, some, and in some cases, they also suffer from social and or a language skill deficit, which makes them hard to be able to communicate with their peers and engage in the environment. And there are many reports about the approximate diagnosis rate in, in the United States, but I've, I was able to find that it affects approximately one in 59 children here in the United States. So it's a fairly common neurodevelopmental disorder within the community. So because, like I mentioned, it's a brain disorder, so we want to try to study it, which is why we use MRI imaging, because we are able to do it safely. And by able to use uh, MRI imaging, we were able to get uh, subjects who have been diagnosed with ASD, compare them to brains who are typically developing, also known as TD subjects, and try to see what are the difference between the two. Unfortunately, MRI scans are expensive and technical. They're very big, clunky machines. The latest three Tesla machine is about $3 million. And in case you guys didn't know, it's about $500 uh, per, per scan per hour. So it's really, really, really expensive. So because of this, a lot of neuroimaging papers have uh, difficulties getting with da data acquisition, and low sample size is a common issue. So in order to, to solve this low data acquisition issue, we, we turn to this uh, international uh, neuroimaging data set known as ABIDE. ABIDE stands for Autism Brain Imaging Data Exchange. It's an international data exchange program uh, created by doc Dr. Adriana DiMartino and Dr. Stuart Matowski to try to solve this uh, small data issue acquisition. It's a, it has 25 uh, international institutions and there's more than 2,000 uh, MRI subjects, uh, subjects who have been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, as well as subjects who are just typically developing normal kids. And these neural imaging scans uh, contain structural scans, which allow us to be able to see the 3D volume of the brain, and functional scans, which allow us to be able to me measure brain activity within the brain. So if, like, if you tap your fingers, your you get brain signals pop up, and we're able to detect that. This is a great data sharing initiative because some scientists tend to be a little bit stingy with the data, they don't like to share, but because of this, a lot of because of this uh, large uh, reservoir of data, neuroscientists around the world are able to use this data to be able to conduct their own research, and this is great because by having a lot of researchers look into this data, we're able to see distinct differences between autistic and typical developing subjects. But before we can use this data for analysis, we, under, we had to go through a quality assessment protocol developed by the lab. This quality assessment protocol is called the Standard Operating Procedure for Quality Assessment. It was uh, created by Emma Schiffsky and the rest of the community team at the Deakin Lab, and the purpose is to quality control, also known as QC neuroimaging data. This is used to analyze the ABI data sets because we want to make sure that the data set is usable for analysis, and, but before you can become research reliable, you must undergo a training, you must uh, take a training, training set, Pass it. You got it. You're given a list of subjects. You got to have an 80% uh, success success rate before you can be considered certified. So why do we want to quality control this data set? Think of it like cooking. You want you're trying to make a you're trying to make a meal, but before you can make a meal, you want to make sure your, your ingredients are good. You got good vegetables, good meat, and all that. Otherwise, if you try to use like nasty raw meat when you're trying to make a hamburger, you're gonna get sick. So we don't want none of that. So the QC outline uh, follows uh, three three main. I guess you can say subject. Uh, 
There's the Atlas registration, where basically we get the raw T1 me metadata, and we match it to a template known as the Montreal New Neurological Institute, also known as M M &I template, and we try to see if they can match up. It's kind of like making sure your left hand matches up with your right hand, make sure your right hand matches up with the left hand, make sure er that the maps all are all on the same page. The second, por the second part of this QC out outline is the structure data, where we look at the, the 3D volume of the brain, and we check out the delineation of the gray and white matter. Those are the two uh, ma matter, the types of uh, brain matter that's within the brain, and we want to make sure that they're delineated or mapped and bordered correctly. That way we can try to see uh, structural brain differences between the two, sub two types of subjects. And the last one is functional data, which I mentioned previously, is to measure brain activity. So what's going on with brain activity in ASD and TD subjects, that's what we're trying to measure, try to see if there's any other reasons that might be able to explain their symptoms. And this QC scoring out outline is guideline is really, really simple. You got three numbers, you got one, usable, it's like getting an A in your class. You got two, which is probable, it's like barely passing with a C minus, may or may not, may or may not have happened to me. And then you have a three, which is unusable, is completely, completely not, not able to be used for analysis. It's kind of like getting an F in the class. So I'm gonna give you guys uh, exa uh, th uh, three examples of a usable, probable, and an unusable scan. So I know this is a pretty lot of information, but right now I want you guys to focus on the unusable scan, which is the scan on your right, my left. So if you look at the frontal lobe, which is like the front part of your brain, right by the, right by the eyes on the left, left this portion of the brain, you can see that the, the red lines, it does not really capture a lot of the gray matter. And that's bad, it's like trying to catch a bunch of fish, but you miss most of them. And because, of, and because of that, that scan is unusable for analysis. And then if you look in the back portion of the brain, you can see it's kind of, it's not straight, like, like, a, like a brain's supposed to look up, look like a skull's supposed to look like. And this is because, it could be due to because of warping. So when you're inside the scanner, you're not supposed to move. You're only allowed to move like 200 micrometers, which is like this. And the reason why you don't want to move in the scanner is because the MRI machine will pick up a signal here, but if you move, it might think it's right here. So that will cause warping where it's just gonna stretch out. And you, don't, and you don't want that in a scan, and that's why this scan was graded as unusable because of either possible movement within the scanner or maybe processing pipeline issues. And then the, the image right underneath it is an example of a functional scan. Uh, this is really, really bad because you're missing about half of the brain, and if you don't believe that that's a bad scan, you try to do this presentation uh, with only half your brain power. So then the second, sc second scan, you see the probable, which is like dead straight in the middle. Uh, if you look at the green circle on, on that image, you can see that, the, that the, in the frontal lobe, the delineation uh, between the gray and white matter is good, but the reason why this is a probable scan is because if you look at that yellow circle in the middle, the delineation goes into the dura, and that's also a possible sign of maybe moving within the scanner, which disqualifies this from being a, a usable scan. And then if you look at the a functional scan on the bottom, you can see that there are some, there are some areas where the red lines does not, does not en fully encompass the brain, whether it be the superior parieto or the frontal lobe. And because of that, it's not quite usable for analysis. And then a the usable scan, it's clear, cut, simple, easy going. Everything is what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to look like, so that gives it a, gives it a one. And the functional scan on the bottom, there's a slight issue with the left temporal lobe, but that's perfect for analysis. So next thing I'm gonna talk about is, the, is, our DCAN, is our DCAN computing pipeline, which, is, which we're gonna be using to try to improve the, improve the MRI scans. So there are gonna be two main approaches. Approach one uses the original Human Connectome project, which is the ACP Minimal Pre-Processing Pipeline. This pipeline was clear, created by Glasser and his colleagues to try to process MRI imaging scans. This is the latest state-of-the-art pipeline, and because of this, a lot of individuals are able to use this pipeline to create high quality imaging scans. But the issue with this Abide data set is that the scans used for, the, the, the scans when they were acquired weren't originally made to be put through this pipeline. And because of this, you might get some issues that I will explain later. And it's kind of, these scans were obtained in the 90s and they were used with older MRI, MRI scanners and this pipeline was designed to be able to process data from newer up-to-date scanners. So because of that, you may, you may have some issues, which is why it's kind of like trying to put a snapshot on your old flip phone, it's not gonna work. So, by, so, we, so our approach two is gonna be using our modified pipeline. It's where we grab the same HCP pipeline, but we're gonna 
tweak it a little bit. It's like grabbing a recipe for, for a dish, but we're just gonna add, adjust the recipe and try to see if we can make it taste better. So we're gonna use that same HTTP pipeline, but we're gonna add this algorithm known as Advanced Normalization Tools, also known as ANTS. This is an algorithm uh, created by Adv Advanced and his, and his colleagues, and we're gonna use that algorithm to try to uh, see if, the, if there's any changes within MRI quality imaging, and try to see if there's any way to see any notable differences, and this is gonna be our DKIM pipeline. So this is gonna be our pipeline overview right here. So I'm just gonna go over this briefly, and if anyone wants to discuss this pipeline further, feel free to uh, uh, let me know if, during our question seminar. So we have the pre-free surfer pipelines, basically where we grab the, our raw DICOM files that we get from the MRI scans, and we, grab, we generate the, the 3D volume of the brain, and we match it to a template, kind of like the Atlas registration I mentioned previously. And then you have free, the free surfer pipeline, which is right here in the middle. This is where you grab the, the brain volume and you delineate the predefined structures. This is where we get the gray and white matter going on in the brain, as I mentioned in the structural scans. And the last portion is the post-free surfer pipeline, and that's where we grab all the M MRI data and we convert them to the SIFTI files, which is, be, which is used to store the data. And the second part of the pipeline is the HTTP functional, functional pipeline, and this is where we're gonna be, get, be able to get all of our functional data. So we got the fMRI volume data where we grab the, this is where the part of the pipeline where you grab all the fMRI data and you, and you normalize it across the 4D structure of the brain. Now what do I mean by 4D? You grab the 3D structure of the brain with respect to time. And we try to use that to measure brain activity during tasks, while the subject's at rest, and in response to stimuli to try to see if there's, what's going on with the brain activity and how the brain's working when they're engaged in possible environmental stimuli. So this pipeline that you see right here is, is approach one. It's the original HCP pipeline, and that's what uh, Glasner and his colleagues were able to invent. And I'm gonna mention the two ANTS corrections that we did to try to see, improve this pipeline. So ANTS corrections one is gonna occur right before the pre-free surfer. The purpose of this uh, algorithm is to denoise denoise the data, basically try to get, so denoising is where we grab is where we try to increase the signal to noise ratio. So we try to make the scans clearer, more easy to see, and make it not so ringy so you can able to properly delineate the gray, the gray and white matters throughout the brain. And then the bias field correction, um, it's where we try to, oops, it's where we try to grab, grab, grab the, if the brain's supposed to be like right here and if it's a little bit out, it's kind of like going to the chiropractor, getting your spine realigned and just pop it back into place. That way we can make sure that the portions of the brain that are supposed to be there will be there. And the second portion of the scan is to use uh, ANTS correction two. And the purpose of this, this portion of the algorithm is to adjust the scan better to the atlas. Make sure, again, make sure that it aligns better because if it aligns better, we make sure that all the parts of the brain that are supposed to be there are gonna be there, which is gonna, in result, gonna give us more accurate, higher quality scans. Now, I know I, mentioned, I, want, no, I went through this and mentioned through a complicated pipeline, so what does this mean for the audience? So we basically grabbed this uh, raw DICOM file that you would get from the MRI imaging. We ran through this pipeline. You're able to get the structural scans from the first portion of the pipeline on the top. And it also generates the functional scans uh, from the func HTTP functional pipelines on the bottom. So my next, so after implementing this uh, this pipeline, reprocessing the scans, my my next step was to try to figure out, all right, how do they compare? How how do, does this do these uh, ANTS correction? Do they make the MRI quality scans better? Do they make them worse? Do they make them the same? And from what I'm able to find with a couple of subjects, that it actually makes them a little bit better. The Im the brain image on the on the very left is an example of a scan that was uh, processed with the original ACP pipe processing. Now, this scan is not horrible, but as you can see, it's not quite clear, it's pretty ringy. It missed, uh, the red lines miss some of the gray matter, and it's not quite as clear, and if you can see the, the circle, on the, the red circle, you can see that the, that the skull shape is not very straight, it's not very curvy, it's kind of kind of wavy. So that can either be, again, either through moving with a scanner, or because of pro processing pipeline issues. So the, in the brain image on the right, that's an example of, the, of a brain scan from the same subject, but instead it was word processed through the new DCAM pipeline, the ACP pipeline, with the ANTS correction. With this, you can see that the gray matter, the brain scan overall looks a lot clearer, and if you look at the, gray, at the green circle, instead of having that wavy, 
portion, portion of the skull going like this, it's nice and curved like it's supposed to be. And then if you look in the blue circle, you can see that a lot more gray and white matter is captured and the scan looks a lot clearer. So, so after, after noticing this with a, with, a bunch of, with a bunch of subjects, I did a uh, quality control analysis using, this, using the same protocol I mentioned previously. Of, of, a, of an abide data set you, uh, that was processed originally with the HCP pipeline and compared it to the new pipeline that we use right here. So I did a quality control of about 180 subjects for, and I did that twice. So I looked at roughly 360 scans to try to see like, all right, how does it improve? And what was really, really interesting is that this improved greatly. So if you look at the pink color or salmon colored uh, portion of the graphs, those are the part, that's the, the numbers you, used to represent the, the modified pipeline, the new HCP pipeline with the, ants, with the ants corrections. And the blue cyan colored are the, the HCP, the original HCP minimal pre-processing pre pipeline. And I'm not sure if you can see it very well, but the, there, they were, they were graded with usable, probable, and unusable. They're labeled on the bottom. If you were to see that the unusable rate for, for both pipelines, you can see the unusable rate is 36% for the original HCP pipeline. That's more than a third of the data set. But the unusable rate for the, for the new DCAM pipeline is only 7%. And then if you look at the usable rate, it increased from 36% to 53%. So it was really, really, it was a drastic improvement. And to everyone in my lab, everyone was happy about it because we showed, hey, we did good science, everything w went well. And then I know there's gonna be statist statisticians over there and this is science, so we need to use stats for everything. So I ran a chi-square analysis and we were able to get a p-value of 3.5 times 10 to the negative eight. So, a rip so in other words, it's really, really statistically significant. So this is great. That means we, we proved that this pipeline improved. We showed that there are data issues with the abide data set, but that doesn't mean that this data set, all the, all the MRI images there, is unusable for analysis. We're able to grab that data set, refine a little bit, and then we could try to improve the data quality and then possibly uh, release it back to the public, but instead of having these, these iffy scans, you're gonna have uh, more reliable and more accurate scans to be able to give to the community. So just to give a little recap, Near imaging is a very, very important technique. It's great. MRI scans, we're able to see the brain without having to cut, cut it open. But as I mentioned previously, MRI scans are very, very expensive. They're very, very technical. They're hard to run. And then also trying to, trying to process the scans take a lot of energy, a lot of, man, a lot of manpower. And it's very, very tricky. It's very, very sensitive, very, very delicate. So you need to be careful with it as well. So the Abide data set is a great publicly available initiative because as I mentioned, that's about 2,000 subjects. So if you do the math, every scan is about, let's say 30 minutes. So that's about 250 times, let's just say 2,000. Actually, I take that back, I'm not gonna do the math. It's, it, we, we save a lot of money and a lot of time. I would, I would use a calculator, but I don't got my phone on me. But yeah, it's a lot of scan, it's a lot of scan data that we're able to do and then also, it's really hard to get really hard to get subjects that are who are who are diagnosed with autism and also typically developing because you got to go through this whole process, the whole, this whole protocol to get them into the universe to get into the into the scanner. And not only that, you need to make sure that the that the children are are not moving in the scanner. Otherwise, it's going to affect data quality. And so, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to make this new pipeline because I'm not sure if you guys remember when you were kids, you, it's very, very hard for us to sit still, very, very hard for us to do what many of you guys are doing very greatly, just sitting still, listening, paying attention. Because I remember when I was a little, little kid, I liked to move around a lot or I get distracted by a little thing and just go left and right. But because of that movement, we're gonna have a data, data issues when we collect these scans. So the improvements to this pipeline is still ongoing because as, a, as just shown right here, we, did, we had very, very gr good improvements, but, that does, but we're not gonna stop there. We wanna get better. We wanna try to see what can we do to improve that because these issues are not gonna go away anytime soon for our MRI scans. So if we ever to figure out like little tricks, little kinks, little things that we can do to improve data quality, we're gonna do them, we're gonna do them, and not only that, but also share, share them with the community. So we're like, hey, this is what we noticed with our scans. Maybe if you do this for your scans, they might improve as well. And that way we, we are able to go back to the main question of like, what's the difference between uh, brain development or brain structure of, 
subjects who have been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, and subjects who are typically developing. So what's causing their symptoms? What's going on right there? And a lot of scientists will like this new pipeline because it will save them time, money, resources, and most importantly, data, because that's the big deal out of all of this. So this is the end of my talk, but before I take questions, I want to give a special thanks to uh, or Oregon Health and Science University for providing me a great workplace, and also the Deacon Lab. I had way too many individuals who have been patient with my many, many questions. I'm a biochemistry major by practice, so going into this world of computer science, MRI scans, and I'm gonna be honest, I'm not that, I wasn't that great in physics at school, so and I had many great people, um, the community team helping me out. I had my mentor, Dr. Eric Pesco, help me out, Eric Earl, Derek Sturgeon, Emma Shivsky, Anders Perron, and many, many, many other people I can mention. And they're all shown in this, in this picture that they've been able to help me out. And as I mentioned, I'm, a st I'm still a student, and I'm not sure if you guys remember, college is expensive. So I want to give a special th thanks to the Robert E. McNair Scholars Program and also the Bill Exeter Program for offering me scholarship money and a research opportunity to do my incredible research that I'm doing up there on OHSU. Without further ado, I'm now open for questions. Thank you for your time.